It was a warm Friday afternoon when General Marcus Daniels, a distinguished African-American military officer in his early 50s, decided to take a drive through a nearby suburban neighborhood. A decorated veteran and high-ranking general in the U.S. Army, Marcus was enjoying a rare day off after returning from a months-long deployment overseas. Dressed casually in jeans and a simple button-up shirt, he looked like any other middle-aged man out for a drive, and that was exactly how he liked it. He was driving a black luxury SUV, a car he had earned through years of service and sacrifice. As he cruised down the quiet streets, he felt a rare sense of peace and freedom, far removed from the high-stakes decisions and disciplined routines of military life. With the radio playing his favorite jazz station and the window cracked open to let in the fresh air, it felt like a perfect day. Marcus reflected on the journey that had brought him here, from his early days growing up in a tough neighborhood, to enlisting in the military straight out of high school, to rising through the ranks to become one of the most respected generals in the country. The path hadn't been easy, but it had shaped him into the man he was today, strong, disciplined, and deeply committed to serving his country. His thoughts were interrupted when he noticed a police cruiser behind him, its lights flashing. At first, Marcus felt no concern. He wasn't speeding, and he knew he hadn't violated any traffic laws. He assumed the officer just needed to pass, or perhaps there was an emergency somewhere down the road. But as the cruiser stayed behind him, Marcus realized he was the one being pulled over. He sighed, pulling to the side of the road. Marcus took a deep breath, keeping his hands visible on the steering wheel. He had been through situations far more intense than a routine traffic stop, but he knew all too well how quickly these encounters could go wrong, especially for a black man, no matter his rank or status. The calm afternoon had suddenly taken a turn, and Marcus prepared himself for whatever came next. As Marcus sat in his SUV, the police officer, a tall white man in his mid-thirties, stepped out of his cruiser. His posture was rigid, his expression hard. He walked briskly toward Marcus's car, one hand resting on his belt near his holstered gun. Marcus's military training kicked in. He remained calm, his eyes following the officer's every move. But there was something in the officer's body language that made Marcus uneasy. The officer reached Marcus's window, his face a mask of suspicion and authority. License and registration, he demanded sharply without so much as a greeting. Marcus nodded reaching for his glove compartment to retrieve the requested documents. As he did, he couldn't help but notice the officer's intense gaze, as if searching for any sign of trouble. May I ask why I'm being stopped, officer? Marcus asked politely, maintaining eye contact. Suspicious behavior, the officer replied curtly, not elaborating further. Marcus furrowed his brow. He hadn't been driving erratically or breaking any laws. It was clear that the officer's suspicion wasn't based on his actions, but on something else. Marcus handed over his license and registration, all the while keeping his movements slow and deliberate to avoid alarming the officer. The officer took the documents without a word of thanks, studying them closely. His eyes flicked back and forth between Marcus and the paperwork, his expression one of deep skepticism. Marcus could feel the tension in the air thickening, the officer's demeanor was not one of someone performing a routine traffic stop. It was one of someone convinced he had caught a criminal. Marcus remained composed, even as the officer's suspicion grew more palpable. The general knew that revealing his military status might de-escalate the situation, but he also wanted to see where this encounter would go. For now, he was just another black man pulled over by the police, and the officer seemed to have already made up his mind about who he was. The officer stepped back, glancing around as if expecting to find something amiss. Step out of the vehicle, he ordered. Marcus's jaw tightened slightly, but he complied, opening the door and stepping onto the pavement. The officer moved quickly, gesturing for Marcus to stand in front of the SUV with his hands visible. What's this about, officer? Marcus asked, trying to keep his tone calm but firm. The officer ignored the question, instead beginning a cursory inspection of the SUV's exterior. You got anything in the car I should know about? Weapons? Drugs? He asked, his tone accusatory. Marcus's eyes narrowed, feeling the insult behind the officer's words. No, nothing like that, Marcus replied evenly. This is my personal vehicle. I haven't done anything wrong. Don't get smart with me, the officer snapped back. He walked around to the rear of the SUV, 
checking the license plate and shining his flashlight into the backseat windows. Even though it was broad daylight, the search was clearly unwarranted, and Marcus could feel his patience wearing thin. But years of military discipline had taught him to remain composed under pressure. After a few minutes, the officer returned to Marcus, his face twisted in a look of dissatisfaction. What are you doing in this neighborhood? He asked. You don't seem like you belong here. The implication was clear, and Marcus felt a surge of anger rise within him. He knew he was being profiled, and the officer had decided that he was out of place based solely on his appearance. This is a public road, officer, Marcus said, his voice steady. I have every right to drive here. Now, if there's no reason to detain me, I'd appreciate it if you let me be on my way. But the officer wasn't ready to back down. He crossed his arms, still eyeing Marcus with suspicion. We'll see about that, he muttered, turning back toward his cruiser to run Marcus's information. It was clear the officer had no idea who he was dealing with. Marcus stood by his SUV, the sun beating down on him as the officer retreated to his cruiser to run his information. He could see the officer through the rear windshield, typing furiously into his onboard computer. Marcus's heart beat steadily, his military training keeping him calm in the face of the officer's aggression. He had been through far worse than this, but he still felt the sting of humiliation. Minutes passed, and the tension in the air grew heavier. Marcus could hear the faint chatter of the police radio as the officer sat in his car, clearly searching for something to justify the stop. It was a familiar tactic, stalling for time, looking for any reason to escalate the situation further. Marcus stood tall, his arms crossed, knowing that his identity as a high-ranking general would soon come to light. The officer's face was partially obscured by the cruiser's window, but Marcus could see his expression change as he continued to look up his information. The officer's brows furrowed, then his eyes widened slightly as he read what was on the screen. Marcus knew the moment had come. The officer was about to realize who he had pulled over. After what felt like an eternity, the officer finally stepped out of his cruiser, his demeanor noticeably altered. His once rigid stance was now more relaxed, his face flushed with the embarrassment of realizing his mistake. Marcus watched as the officer approached, no longer exuding the same hostility as before. The tables had turned, and the officer knew it. Um, uh, sir, the officer began, stumbling over his words. I, I apologize for the inconvenience. It seems there's been a misunderstanding. Marcus didn't respond immediately, letting the officer squirm in the silence. He could see the officer struggling to reconcile his earlier assumptions with the reality of who Marcus was. And in that moment, Marcus knew he had a choice, to let the officer off easy or to make a point. Marcus decided to reveal his true identity, not out of a need to boast, but to make the officer understand the gravity of his actions. Yes, officer. Marcus said slowly, his voice filled with calm authority. There has been a misunderstanding. I am General Marcus Daniels, a senior officer in the United States Army. And I must say, this treatment is far from what I would expect for someone who has served this country. The officer's face went pale and he took a step back, clearly at a loss for words. I, I didn't realize, he stammered, his earlier arrogance replaced with an air of desperation. I apologize, General. I didn't mean to. I was just following procedure. Marcus shook his head, feeling both frustration and disappointment. He had seen this kind of backtracking before. Apologies given only when someone realized they had made a mistake in judgment. Following procedure, Marcus repeated, his voice carrying the weight of his rank and experience. Pulling over a law-abiding citizen, searching his car without cause, and questioning his right to be in a neighborhood? That's your idea of procedure? The officer couldn't meet Marcus's gaze, his eyes darting to the ground. No, sir, that's not, that's not what I meant. Marcus could have let it end there. He could have accepted the apology, gotten back in his car, and driven away. But he knew that doing so would be a disservice to all those who had faced similar treatment without the benefit of rank or title to protect them. I suggest you think carefully about how you conduct yourself in the future, officer, Marcus said, his tone steady but firm. Not everyone you pull over will have the privilege of being able to stand up for themselves like I do. The officer nodded quickly, 
mumbling another apology before handing back Marcus's license and registration. As Marcus returned to his car, he felt a mixture of emotions, relief, anger, and a renewed sense of responsibility. He had been fortunate to be in a position to stand up to this kind of treatment, but he knew that many others were not so lucky. With his license and registration returned, Marcus got back into his SUV, feeling the eyes of the officer still on him. He took a deep breath, placing his hands back on the steering wheel. For a moment, he sat in silence, trying to process the events of the past 20 minutes. The tension of the confrontation was slowly dissolving, but he knew that what had just happened wasn't merely a misunderstanding. It was a symptom of a much larger issue. Marcus started the engine, the car humming to life beneath him. He adjusted the rearview mirror, catching a glimpse of the officer walking back to his cruiser, his posture deflated, his head hanging slightly. It was clear that the officer was embarrassed, perhaps even regretful. But Marcus knew that the shame the officer felt wasn't necessarily born out of genuine understanding. It was the shame of being caught. The SUV pulled back onto the road and Marcus drove away, leaving the police cruiser behind. He wished he could let the incident slide off his shoulders, chalk it up to an overzealous cop on a power trip. But as the general reflected on the experience, he couldn't shake the feeling of how quickly things could have gone differently, how the color of his skin had initially framed the officer's entire approach. Marcus's military training and high status in the armed forces had made the situation end with minimal harm to him. But what if he hadn't been General Marcus Daniels? What if he had just been another black man pulled over on a quiet suburban road? The thought was haunting, and it fueled Marcus's determination to use his voice and platform to make sure that no one else would have to endure such treatment. Driving down the sunlit street, Marcus decided he would not stay silent about what had happened. It wasn't about seeking revenge against the officer. It was about shining a light on the everyday experiences of black Americans and using his influence to advocate for fairer policing. He had faced discrimination before, but this time he would turn the experience into a catalyst for change. That evening after Marcus returned home, he sat down at the dinner table with his wife, Lena, and their teenage son, Joshua. Lena immediately noticed the strain on Marcus's face. What happened today? She asked softly, setting down a plate of food. Marcus sighed, rubbing the back of his neck. I was pulled over by the police, he said, keeping his voice level. It wasn't pretty. Lena's eyes widened in concern, and Joshua looked up from his phone, his expression a mix of curiosity and anger. Are you okay, Dad? Joshua asked, his voice tinged with worry. Marcus nodded, forcing a reassuring smile. I'm fine, but the way the officer treated me, it wasn't right. He didn't know who I was, and he treated me like a criminal just because of how I look. Joshua shook his head, clenching his fists. See? This is exactly what I've been telling you about, Dad. It happens all the time. And it's not fair that you had to go through that, even with everything you've done for this country. Marcus reached out, placing a hand on his son's shoulder. I know, son, and that's why I need to do something about it. Lena, ever supportive and understanding, nodded in agreement. What do you plan to do? She asked, her voice calm but firm. Marcus looked between his wife and son, feeling a swell of determination. I'm going to make sure that what happened to me doesn't happen to anyone else. It's time we hold people accountable, not just for how they treat black men and women like me, but for how they carry out their duty to serve and protect. The family spent the rest of the evening discussing how they could turn this negative experience into a positive force for change. Marcus knew that going public with his story wouldn't be easy. It would invite criticism, controversy, and possibly backlash from those who saw him as challenging the status quo. But he also knew that it was necessary. He had a duty to stand up, not just for himself, but for everyone who had been humiliated, mistreated, or dehumanized based on assumptions and prejudice. The next day, Marcus began making calls to colleagues in the military, to friends in the media, and to organizations that work toward police reform. He shared his story, describing the officer's treatment and the implicit bias that had fueled the entire encounter. The response was immediate and overwhelming. People were shocked, angry, and deeply moved by Marcus's account. He was encouraged to go public, to use his voice to speak out against injustice 
and call for systemic change. Now, Marcus scheduled an interview with a respected news anchor, someone who was known for tackling difficult conversations head on. The interview was set to be aired live on a national news network, and Marcus knew that it would reach millions of viewers. He spent hours preparing for the interview, going over the details of what had happened and the message he wanted to convey. On the day of the interview, Marcus sat in a well-lit television studio. The camera focused on him as the news anchor introduced his story to the audience. The anchor, a middle-aged black woman with an empathetic demeanor, asked him to recount the events of that afternoon. Marcus spoke clearly and calmly, detailing every aspect of the encounter, from the officer's aggressive approach to his own decision to reveal his military status. But this isn't just about me, Marcus said, his voice firm as he addressed the camera. This is about every black man, woman, and child who has been unfairly judged, who has faced humiliation and mistreatment simply because of the way they look. It's about a system that allows these biases to go unchecked, and it's about time we hold our law enforcement to a higher standard, one that protects all of us equally. The interview quickly went viral, sparking conversations across social media and igniting debates on television, in newspapers, and among policymakers. Marcus's story struck a chord, resonating with those who had faced similar experiences and inspiring others to speak out about their encounters with discrimination and racial profiling. The days following Marcus's interview were filled with a whirlwind of reactions. Messages poured in from across the country. Some were words of support and encouragement, while others were critical, even hostile. There were those who praised Marcus for his courage, who saw him as a hero standing up against injustice. But there were also those who accused him of making a big deal out of nothing, of trying to paint the police as villains. Civil rights organizations reached out, wanting to partner with Marcus to push for police reform and accountability. Military veterans, both black and white, voiced their solidarity, sharing their own stories of mistreatment and support for Marcus's efforts to bring about change. His story had become more than just a personal experience. It had become a catalyst for a national conversation about race, privilege, and the role of law enforcement in America. Meanwhile, police departments across the country responded to the story in varying ways. Some took the opportunity to reflect on their own practices and policies, issuing statements about the need for bias training and community engagement. Others pushed back, arguing that Marcus's story was an isolated incident and not representative of law enforcement as a whole. Amidst all the reactions, Marcus remained focused on the larger goal, making sure that what happened to him would lead to real change. He used the momentum of the public response to advocate for policy changes, working with lawmakers to propose new training requirements for police officers, the implementation of body cameras, and stronger accountability measures for misconduct. The general's voice carried weight, not only because of his military status, but because of the sincerity and passion with which he spoke. And as the conversation continued to spread, it became clear that Marcus was not just speaking for himself. He was speaking for everyone who had ever felt dehumanized by a system that should protect them. After his story gained national attention, Marcus received a call from the local police chief, a middle-aged white man named Chief Patterson. The chief had seen the interview, and he knew that the department was now under intense scrutiny. He requested a meeting with Marcus to discuss what had happened, and Marcus agreed, knowing that this would be an opportunity to address the issues head on. The meeting took place at the police department, a large sterile building with officers moving in and out of the hallways. Marcus was led to a conference room where Chief Patterson and a few senior officers sat waiting. The tension in the room was palpable as Marcus took his seat, facing the very people who were responsible for holding their officers accountable. General Daniels, Chief Patterson began, his voice formal but tense. First, let me say that I deeply regret what happened to you. The officer's conduct was unacceptable, and it does not reflect the values of this department. We take this matter seriously, and we want to assure you that it will be addressed. Marcus nodded, but he wasn't there just to hear apologies. Chief Patterson, this isn't just about me, he replied, his voice steady. This is about the culture within your department, the assumptions that are made, the biases that go unchecked. I was fortunate enough to be in a position to defend myself. But what about the people who aren't? What about the men and women who are treated like criminals because of their race, who don't have a platform to speak out? 
The chief looked down, his expression conflicted. You're right, he admitted. We need to do better, and we're willing to work with you to make the necessary changes. We're prepared to implement new training programs, to conduct an internal review of our practices, and to rebuild trust with the community. Marcus listened carefully, weighing the sincerity of the chief's words. He knew that promises were one thing, but action was another. Then let's get to work, Marcus said finally. Let's make sure that what happened to me never happens again, to anyone. In the weeks that followed, Marcus and Chief Patterson organized a community forum to address concerns directly from residents. Held in a local community center, the event brought together people from all walks of life, black and white, young and old, civilians and police officers. It was a gathering that had been long overdue, and the room buzzed with anticipation and tension. Marcus arrived early, taking a moment to look around the packed room before the discussion began. He saw faces filled with skepticism, frustration, and hope. Many residents had come to voice their anger and demand accountability. Others were there to listen and understand. Police officers, dressed in their uniforms, sat at the back of the room, their expressions serious but open. Marcus felt the weight of the responsibility on his shoulders. This was a chance to bridge the divide, to make real change. The forum began with Chief Patterson addressing the crowd, acknowledging the issues that had brought everyone there. We know that there are concerns about how we serve this community, he said, his voice firm but conciliatory. We're here today to listen, to learn, and to find a way forward together. General Daniels has helped us see where we need to do better, and we're committed to making those changes. Marcus then took the microphone, standing at the center of the room, and spoke about his experience. He didn't hold back the fear, the humiliation. All of it was right bare, but he also spoke about his belief in the power of unity, in the need for understanding and accountability. <laughs> we unless we do it together, he said, looking around at the officers and residents alike. It's time we have these difficult conversations, no matter how uncomfortable they are. The floor was then open for questions and comments. People shared their stories of encounters with the police, some positive, others heartbreaking. Officers listened as residents spoke about their fear of being stopped, their frustration with being treated as suspects in their own neighborhoods. There were heated exchanges, moments of silence, and tears. But by the end of the forum, there was also a sense of progress, a step toward healing and understanding that had long been missing. Toward the end of the community forum, something unexpected happened. The very officer who had pulled over Marcus that afternoon, Officer Reynolds, stood up and asked to speak. The room fell silent as he walked to the front, the tension palpable. Marcus watched him closely, curious to see what he would say. Standing before the crowd, Officer Reynolds was visibly nervous. He fidgeted with his hands and glanced at Marcus before turning to address the room. I, I owe you all an apology, he began, his voice shaky but sincere, especially to General Daniels. The way I handled that traffic stop, it was wrong. I made assumptions based on race, and I let those assumptions guide my actions. That's not how a police officer should act and it's not the example I want to set. The officer's words hung in the air, and for a moment, the room was silent. Marcus could see the struggle in Reynolds' eyes, the conflict of a man coming to terms with his own biases. It was rare to hear an officer admit fault so openly, and Marcus appreciated the courage it took to stand before the community and take responsibility. Marcus stepped forward, meeting Reynolds' gaze. It takes a lot to admit when you're wrong, Marcus said his voice carrying a tone of understanding. But admitting it is just the first step. I hope that what happened between us serves as a lesson, not just for you, but for every officer who wears that badge. We need to do better, all of us, and that starts with moments like this. The room erupted into applause, some cheering for the officer's bravery, others for Marcus's grace in accepting the apology. It was a powerful moment, one that spoke to the potential for change when people are willing to listen, learn, and move forward together. 
Marcus knew that there was still a long way to go, but for the first time, he felt hopeful that they were on the right path. After the forum, Chief Patterson and Marcus began working closely to implement the reforms that had been discussed. The first step was mandatory bias training for all officers in the department. Marcus sat in on some of the sessions, watching as officers of various backgrounds were challenged to confront their own prejudices and assumptions. The training focused on cultural sensitivity, de-escalation tactics, and the importance of treating every citizen with respect, regardless of their race or appearance. It wasn't easy. Some officers were resistant, seeing the training as unnecessary or an attack on their profession. But others were open to change, recognizing that the way they interacted with the community had a direct impact on public trust and safety. Marcus made it a point to engage with these officers, to hear their concerns and address their questions. I know this feels uncomfortable, he told them, but change is never easy. And if we're going to build a better relationship with the people we serve, we need to start with ourselves. Another key reform was the implementation of body cameras, a measure that Marcus had strongly advocated for. Chief Patterson and the department agreed to equip every officer with a camera, ensuring that interactions between police and civilians were recorded for transparency and accountability. It was a move that was met with some pushback, but Marcus stood firm in his belief that the cameras would protect both the officers and the community they served. Community policing initiatives were also expanded. Officers were encouraged to spend more time in neighborhoods, getting to know residents outside of enforcement contexts. Block parties, town hall meetings, and youth mentorship programs became part of the department's outreach, creating opportunities for positive interactions between officers and the people they served. Marcus saw the difference it made. Conversations were easier, trust was slowly being rebuilt, and for the first time in a long time, there was a sense of partnership between the police and the community. Despite the progress being made, Marcus faced criticism from all sides. Some in the community felt that he was working too closely with the police, that he was letting them off the hook too easily. How can you trust them after what they did to you? One activist demanded at a community meeting. They'll say they're changing, but nothing really changes. Marcus understood their frustration. I hear you, he said, addressing the crowd. I know that trust isn't something that's built overnight, and I know that change doesn't come without resistance, but I believe in accountability, and I believe in giving people the chance to be better. That doesn't mean we stop holding them responsible. It means we hold them to a higher standard. On the other side, some officers felt that Marcus was asking too much, too quickly. Police unions argued that the new policies were making it harder for officers to do their jobs, that the focus on accountability was leading to a war on police. Marcus met with union representatives, listening to their concerns but standing firm in his commitment to reform. This isn't about making your job harder, he told them. It's about making sure that everyone is treated fairly, with respect and dignity. It's about creating a department that the community can trust. For every critic, there were also supporters, people who saw the value in Marcus's work and the impact it was having. Local politicians praised his efforts, Civil rights leaders commended his courage, and residents who had once feared the police began to feel more secure in their neighborhoods. Marcus was becoming a symbol of change, a reminder that one person's voice could make a difference. Amidst all the public work, Marcus never lost sight of his family. One evening, after a long day of meetings and reform discussions, he sat down with his son Joshua, who was struggling to understand the complexities of his father's work. Dad, I don't get it. Joshua said, his brow furrowed. Why are you trying so hard to help the police when they treated you like that? Why not just fight against them? Marcus looked at his son, understanding the confusion and anger behind his words. It's not about helping or fighting against them, Marcus explained gently. It's about making sure that they're doing their job the right way. It's about making things better, not just for us, but for everyone. If we can change the way they see people like us, if we can make them see us as equals, then we're making the world a safer place for everyone. Joshua nodded slowly, still processing his father's words. But what if they don't change? What if they keep doing the same thing? He asked, his voice filled with the kind of fear and frustration that only a teenager could express. Marcus wrapped his arm around his son, pulling him close. Then we keep fighting, he said simply. 
We keep pushing, we keep speaking out, and we never stop until the world is as it should be. In that moment, Marcus felt the weight of the responsibility he carried, not just as a general, not just as a public figure, but as a father who wanted to make sure that his son grew up in a world where he didn't have to fear those who were sworn to protect him. And as they sat together, father and son, Marcus knew that every step he took, every reform he fought for, was a step toward a future where justice and equality were more than just ideals. They were realities. As Marcus continued his work on reform, he found allies in unexpected places. One day he received a call from a state senator, a white woman named Grace Collins, who had seen his story on the news and was moved by his call for change. General Daniels, I admire what you're doing, she said over the phone. I think we have an opportunity here to make real, lasting reforms, not just in your city, but across the state. I'd like to work with you. Marcus was encouraged by her willingness to help. He knew that meaningful reform often required collaboration across political lines, and Senator Collins's support could help elevate their efforts. The two arranged a meeting at the state capitol, and Marcus quickly realized that they shared a common vision, a justice system that was fair, transparent, and accountable to all. Over the following weeks, Marcus and Grace began drafting a statewide police reform bill. They spent long hours in discussions, analyzing existing policies, consulting with legal experts, and listening to feedback from community leaders and law enforcement. The bill focused on key areas, mandatory bias training for officers across the state, the use of body cameras in all police departments, independent review boards to investigate misconduct, and new standards for community policing. It wasn't easy. Some lawmakers pushed back, arguing that the reforms were too restrictive, that they would undermine the authority of the police. But Marcus... They spoke passionately about the need for change, about the potential for building communities. Slowly, they began to gain support from lawmakers who saw the value in their efforts. Marcus knew that they were taking on a monumental task, but he felt a sense of momentum building. What had started as a personal encounter with injustice was now evolving into a statewide movement for reform. And with allies like Grace by his side, Marcus believed that they could make a real difference, not just for his community, but for communities across the state. As part of their campaign to build support for the reform bill, Marcus and Grace decided to take their message directly to the people. They traveled to towns and cities across the state, hosting public forums, town halls and discussions to explain the bill's goals and gather input from residents. At each stop, Marcus shared his story, the traffic stop that had sparked it all, the humiliation, the struggle for accountability, and how it had inspired him to fight for change. The response was overwhelmingly positive. People listened with rapt attention as Marcus spoke about the importance of fairness and justice, about the need to hold those in power accountable for their actions. Residents shared their own experiences with law enforcement. Some spoke of fear and distrust, while others spoke of hope for better relationships. The conversations were raw, emotional, and transformative. In one town, a middle-aged black woman stood up during a town hall and shared a story that brought tears to the eyes of everyone in the room. I was pulled over once, just like you, she said, her voice trembling. I was scared. I didn't know what would happen. But hearing your story, it gives me hope. Hope that things can change, that my son won't have to go through what I went through. Marcus reached out to her, holding her hand and offering words of encouragement. It was moments like this that fueled his determination to keep fighting, to keep telling his story. He knew that change didn't happen in silence. It happened when people spoke out, when they shared their experiences and demanded better. The campaign trail was exhausting, but it was also invigorating. Marcus and Grace saw firsthand the impact of their message, the way it resonated with people from all walks of life. And as they traveled from town to town, they built a coalition of supporters who were ready to stand with them and push for the reforms they knew were necessary. The day finally came when the reform bill was brought to the floor of the state legislature for debate. The chamber was packed. Lawmakers, media, community leaders, and residents had all come to witness the historic moment. Marcus sat beside Grace in the gallery, his heart pounding as the debate began. 
He knew that the outcome of this vote would determine whether all their efforts had been worth it. The arguments for and against the bill were fierce. Supporters spoke about the need for accountability, for better relationships between police and communities, for a justice system that was fair to all. This isn't about being anti-police, one lawmaker argued passionately. This is about being pro-justice. It's about ensuring that our officers are equipped to serve and protect all our citizens with integrity and respect. Opponents, however, were just as vocal. Some argued that the bill would make it harder for officers to do their jobs, that it would lead to increased crime and make communities less safe. We're asking our police to do an impossible job, a critic said, shaking his head. And now we're going to tie their hands even more? This bill goes too far? Marcus watched the debate unfold, feeling both hopeful and anxious. He knew that change was never easy, that there would always be those who resisted progress. But he also knew that the bill represented a chance, a chance to make real, meaningful change that would benefit everyone. Finally, after hours of debate, the time came for the vote. The room was silent as lawmakers cast their ballots, and Marcus held his breath, his hands clenched tightly in his lap. The final tally was read aloud, and the bill passed by a narrow margin. The room erupted into applause, and Marcus felt a wave of relief and triumph wash over him. It was a victory, a hard-fought, hard-won victory that would change the lives of countless people across the state. And as Marcus hugged Grace, his eyes filled with tears of gratitude and determination, he knew that this was just the beginning. In the weeks following the bill's passage, Marcus was invited to a gathering in the very community where he had been pulled over months before. The gathering was organized by residents who wanted to thank him for his efforts and celebrate the progress that had been made. It was a chance to reflect, to heal, and to look forward to the future with hope. When Marcus arrived, he was met with warm smiles, handshakes, and hugs. People thanked him for his courage, for using his voice to speak out against injustice. They shared stories of how the new reforms were already making a difference, how officers were engaging more with the community, how residents felt safer and more respected. But the most emotional moment came when Marcus was approached by a young black man named Andre, who had been there that day of the traffic stop. General Daniels, I was there that day, Andre said quietly, his voice filled with emotion. I saw how that officer treated you, and I didn't know what to do. But seeing you stand up, seeing you speak out, it gave me strength. It made me realize that I can make a difference too. Marcus was deeply moved. He hugged Andre tightly, feeling the strength of the younger man's embrace. You can make a difference, Marcus said, his voice steady. We all can, and we need people like you, people who are willing to stand up and fight for what's right. The gathering ended with a powerful moment of unity. Residents, police officers, and community leaders stood together, hands linked, as they pledged to continue working toward justice, understanding, and equality. And as Marcus looked around at the faces of those who had come together, he knew that this was a community that was ready to move forward, together. After months of hard work, difficult conversations, and public advocacy, Marcus finally took a moment to celebrate with the people who mattered most, his family. He and Lena hosted a small gathering at their home, inviting close friends, family members, and some of the key allies who had supported him throughout the journey. It was a time to relax, to reflect, and to enjoy the fruits of their labor. The backyard was decorated with twinkling lights and tables filled with food, and the atmosphere was one of joy and gratitude. Joshua, now fully understanding the impact of his father's work, stood proudly by his side, helping serve food and laughing with guests. Lena was the perfect hostess, welcoming everyone with her warm smile and making sure that everyone felt at home. As the night went on, Marcus found himself surrounded by laughter, music, and the love of those who had supported him. He watched as his friends and family danced, told stories, and shared their hopes for the future. It was a rare moment of peace and contentment, a reminder of what they had been fighting for all along. At one point in the evening, Lena pulled Marcus aside, her eyes sparkling in the soft glow of the lights. I'm so proud of you, she said, wrapping her arms around his neck. What you've done, it's changed everything, not just for us, but for so many people. And I know that you'll keep making a difference, no matter what comes next. Marcus smiled, holding his wife close. I couldn't have done it without you, he said. 
Without your support, your strength, you kept me going even when things got tough. This victory, it's as much yours as it is mine. As they stood together looking out over the celebration, Marcus felt a deep sense of fulfillment. It had been a long journey, filled with challenges and struggles, but it had all been worth it. And now, as they faced the future together, Marcus knew that they were ready for whatever came next. With the passage of the reform bill and the community's newfound sense of unity, Marcus felt that it was important to focus on building bridges between residents and the police officers who served them. He knew that policies and laws were important, but real change required building relationships and fostering understanding on a human level. It was time to bring everyone together, not just in structured forms, but in more personal, meaningful ways. Marcus started by organizing a day of dialogue, where officers and community members could meet outside the context of enforcement or formal meetings. Held in a local park, the event was designed to be informal and open, with tables of food, games for children, and spaces for people to sit and talk. Officers arrived in casual clothing instead of their uniforms, encouraged to approach the day as neighbors rather than law enforcers. The day began tentatively, with both residents and officers unsure of how to engage. The air was thick with the tension of past encounters, and for a while, it seemed like everyone was staying in their own corners. But as the hours passed, people began to open up. Children played basketball with young officers. Teenagers asked questions about life on the force, and parents spoke about their hopes for safer neighborhoods. Marcus made his way around the park, engaging in conversations, laughing with residents, and sharing stories with officers. He watched as an elderly black man sat down with a young white officer, both of them talking earnestly as they exchanged perspectives. He saw a group of officers kneel down to play with a group of toddlers who giggled as they blew bubbles together. It was a day of breaking down barriers, of seeing each other as people rather than adversaries. By the end of the day, Marcus felt a deep sense of accomplishment. The park was alive with the sounds of connection, voices overlapping, laughter ringing out, and stories being shared. It wasn't the end of the journey, but it was a powerful step forward, one that gave Marcus hope for the future. Not long after the day of dialogue, a major test of the reforms came to light. There was an incident in a neighboring town involving a police officer who used excessive force during an arrest of a black teenager. The incident was caught on a body camera, and the footage quickly spread across social media, sparking outrage and protests. People demanded accountability, and all eyes turned to Marcus, now seen as a leading voice in law enforcement reform. Marcus knew that how this incident was handled would either reinforce or undermine all the progress they had made. He immediately reached out to Chief Patterson and other law enforcement leaders, urging them to respond with transparency and integrity. We need to show the community that we are serious about accountability, Marcus said. If this officer acted improperly, it needs to be addressed swiftly and fairly. We can't afford to go back to how things were. The police department released the footage and launched an independent investigation into the officer's conduct. Marcus met with the family of the teenager, offering his support and assuring them that justice would be pursued. He also spoke at community events, emphasizing the importance of due process and the need to hold those in power accountable. The investigation concluded within weeks, finding that the officer had violated department policy and used excessive force. Disciplinary actions were taken, and the officer faced consequences for his behavior. While the incident was a stark reminder of the work that still needed to be done, Marcus felt that the way it was handled showed the impact of the reforms. Swift, transparent action that prioritized justice and trust. The protests that had started in anger ended in peaceful demonstrations, calling for unity and continued change. And as Marcus stood with the community during these demonstrations, he felt reassured that they were moving in the right direction, even if the path was not always smooth. The reforms were beginning to show their effects across the state. Police departments reported that body cameras were helping de-escalate tense encounters, both for officers and civilians. The bias training was opening up conversations among officers that had never been had before. Discussions about race, privilege, and the power dynamics that existed between police and communities of color. Chief Patterson, who had once been hesitant about the changes, became one of the strongest advocates for the reforms. He spoke at conferences, law enforcement gatherings, and community events, 
sharing the positive impact the new policies had on his officers and the communities they served. I'll be honest, he admitted during one event, standing beside Marcus. I didn't think these reforms were necessary at first, but now I see how much better our officers are prepared and how much more trust we're building. It's made us better at our jobs. Other police departments across the state took note of the success. Marcus received calls from police chiefs and sheriffs asking for advice on implementing similar reforms in their own communities. It became clear that what had started as a local issue was now having a ripple effect, inspiring change in cities and towns far beyond the original scope of the reforms. Marcus was invited to speak at law enforcement academies, training sessions, and community police engagement events. He spoke openly about the challenges of reform, about the importance of listening and learning, and about the power of empathy in building better relationships. His words carried weight, not only because of his rank, but because of the lived experience and sincerity behind them. It wasn't just about changing policies, it was about changing mindsets. And as Marcus traveled from place to place, sharing his story and advocating for better practices, he saw the spark of understanding in the eyes of those who listen, the spark of possibility. Though Marcus was proud of all they had accomplished, he knew that his work came at a cost, especially to his family. The long hours, the media attention, and the constant travel often kept him away from home, and he missed the quiet moments with Lena and Joshua. One evening after a particularly exhausting day, Marcus sat down with Lena to talk about the future. I feel like I'm being pulled in a hundred different directions, he admitted, leaning back on the couch beside her. The reforms, the meetings, the speaking engagements, it's all so important. But sometimes I wonder if I'm spreading myself too thin. I don't want to lose sight of what matters most, our family. Lena nodded. You've done so much, Marcus, she said gently, more than anyone could have asked for. And I know you want to keep making a difference, but maybe it's time to think about what balance looks like for us, for you. The conversation was bittersweet. Marcus loved his work, loved fighting for justice and fairness, but he also loved being present for his son's basketball games, for family dinners, for the simple moments that made life whole. He knew that whatever decision he made, it had to be one that honored both his commitment to his community and his commitment to his family. After much reflection, Marcus decided to step back from some of his public duties, focusing more on the local level and mentoring younger leaders to carry on the work. He would still be involved, his voice and guidance would still be present, but he also wanted to ensure that his family got the time and attention they deserved. It was a difficult decision, but one that felt right for where he was in life. As Marcus began to take a step back, he was heartened to see new leaders emerging, young men and women who were passionate about justice, equality, and the power of community. Among them was his own son, Joshua, who had grown from a questioning teenager into a thoughtful, determined young man eager to make his own mark on the world. Joshua became active in social justice initiatives at his school, organizing events to raise awareness about issues like racial profiling, police reform, and community building. He worked closely with youth groups, faith-based organizations, and local activists, bringing people together and creating spaces for dialogue and understanding. Marcus watched with pride as his son developed into a confident, articulate leader who wasn't afraid to speak his mind and fight for what was right. One evening, Joshua approached his father with an idea. Dad, I want to start a mentorship program, he said, his eyes alight with enthusiasm. A program that connects young people with community leaders, police officers, and each other. I think we can make a real difference by getting people to talk to each other, to learn from each other. Will you help me? Marcus's heart swelled with pride. He saw so much of himself in Joshua, the passion, the drive, the belief in a better world. Of course I'll help you, Marcus said, embracing his son. This is what it's all about, passing the torch, making sure that the next generation has what they need to keep moving forward. The mentorship program quickly took off, bringing together a diverse group of students, mentors, and community members. The sessions were filled with open conversations, role-playing exercises, and opportunities for young people to engage with police officers and local leaders. It was a space for growth, understanding, and hope. A space where the seeds of change were being sown for the future. 
The mentorship program spearheaded by Joshua became a cornerstone of community building in the town. Each week, students and local leaders gathered in schools, churches, and community centers to share their experiences, to learn from one another, and to bridge the gaps that had long divided them. Joshua brought an energy and authenticity to the program that drew people in, making them feel seen and heard in a way that traditional initiatives often failed to do. One particular session stood out to Marcus, a moment when he saw just how powerful the next generation could be. A young black student named Malik, who had joined the program reluctantly, finally opened up during a discussion about race and policing. I used to think the cops were all against us, Malik admitted, his voice wavering with emotion. But hearing everyone talk, especially the officers, I get that they're just people too. I still don't trust all of them, but I want to try. I want to be part of making things better. The room was quiet as Malik spoke, the weight of his words settling over everyone like a warm blanket. Joshua sat beside Malik, nodding supportively. And that's all we're asking, Joshua said, for everyone to be willing to listen, to try to understand each other. That's how we start to heal. Marcus watched from the back of the room, feeling a swell of pride and hope. This was exactly what he had dreamed of, a space where people of all ages, backgrounds, and perspectives could come together and see each other's humanity. And the fact that it was his own son leading the way made it all the more meaningful. Joshua was carrying the torch of leadership with grace and strength, and Marcus knew that the future was in good hands. The mentorship program continued to grow, expanding into neighboring towns and drawing interest from organizations across the state. It became a model for community police relations, a blueprint for how to build trust through empathy, dialogue, and shared experiences. And as Marcus continued to support Joshua, from behind the scenes, he felt a sense of fulfillment, knowing that his work had laid the foundation for something truly transformative. The impact of Marcus's work and the mentorship program caught the attention of national media once again, leading to invitations for Marcus and Joshua to share their story on various platforms, podcasts, news shows, and even a popular morning television program. The interviews focused not only on Marcus's original encounter with the police, but also on the broader reforms that had come from it and the community work spearheaded by Joshua and the next generation. The father and son duo made a powerful team, Marcus with his measured, experienced perspective and Joshua with his passionate, youthful energy. They spoke candidly about the challenges they faced, the resistance they encountered, and the hope they felt for a better future. They shared their belief in the power of storytelling, in the ability of people to change when they are given the opportunity to see one another as equals. One particularly moving interview took place in front of a live audience. After sharing their story, a young black woman from the audience stood up, tears in her eyes. I just want to say thank you, she said, her voice trembling. Thank you for being brave enough to speak out, to do what you're doing. I'm a police officer, and I know how hard it can be to be caught between wanting to do right by my community and following the rules of the department. You've given me hope that we can find a way to do both. Marcus and Joshua were both deeply moved by her words. Thank you for sharing your story, Joshua said, looking directly at her. It's people like you who inspire us to keep going. We all have a role to play in making our communities safer and fairer, and we're grateful to have allies like you. The interview aired to widespread acclaim, sparking discussions across the country about police reform, community engagement, and the role of youth leadership in driving change. And as Marcus and Joshua continued to tell their story, they knew that they were not just reflecting on the past, they were shaping the future. The reforms in community programs had not only changed how residents saw the police, but also how officers saw their role in the community. Many officers who had once resisted the changes now openly embraced them, seeing the benefits firsthand in their daily interactions. The bias training, body cameras, and focus on de-escalation had improved not only public trust, but also officers' safety and morale. One of the most profound changes was in the way officers viewed their relationship with the people they served. Instead of seeing themselves solely as enforcers of the law, they began to see themselves as guardians of the community, protectors who were there to support and uplift the people they encountered. 
officers began to attend community events regularly, not just as security, but as participants, playing in youth basketball games, attending barbecues, and mentoring young people. Officer Reynolds, the officer who had originally pulled Marcus over, became one of the most active participants in the new programs. He made a point to engage with the residents he served, volunteering in after-school programs and helping organize community police workshops. One day he approached Marcus at a community event, his face earnest and open. I just wanted to say, thank you, Reynolds said quietly. Thank you for giving me the chance to do better. I'm trying to live up to that every day. Marcus shook Reynolds' hand, meeting his gaze with sincerity. It takes a big person to acknowledge their mistakes and work to fix them, he said. I respect that, and I'm glad to see you're making a difference. The trust between officers and the community continued to grow, with fewer complaints of misconduct and an increase in positive interactions. Marcus could see that the culture of policing was beginning to shift, slowly but surely, and it filled him with hope that the reforms they had fought for were not just words on paper, but actions that were changing lives. One evening, as Marcus sat on the porch with Lena, the two of them reflected on the journey they had been through. It had been years since that fateful traffic stop, years of struggle, progress, and triumph. They had faced criticism, challenges, and moments of doubt, but they had also seen the power of resilience, courage, and unity. Marcus leaned back in his chair, watching the sun set over their town. It's hard to believe how far we've come, he said softly. Sometimes I wonder if things would have been different if that officer hadn't pulled me over that day. But then I think, maybe it was meant to happen. Maybe we needed that moment to push for all this change. Lena nodded, her eyes fixed on the horizon. You've done so much, Marcus, she said, her voice filled with love and admiration. You've changed the way people see each other, the way they understand justice. And now Joshua is carrying that legacy forward. You should be proud. I am, Marcus replied, smiling as he thought of his son. I'm proud of all of us, our family, our community, our allies. We've come together in a way I never thought possible, and I know there's still work to be done, but I'm ready for whatever comes next. The couple sat in comfortable silence for a while, listening to the sounds of their neighborhood, the laughter of children playing, the distant music from a nearby party, the chirping of evening crickets. It was a peaceful moment, a reminder that amidst all the struggles, there was still beauty and joy to be found. And as the last light of the day faded into twilight, Marcus felt a deep sense of gratitude for the journey they had traveled. A journey of growth, of struggle, and of hope. Years later, as Joshua stood on a stage at his college graduation, Marcus and Lena sat in the audience, beaming with pride. Joshua had followed in his father's footsteps, becoming a powerful voice for justice and equality in his own right. He had been accepted into law school, with plans to pursue a career in civil rights law and continue the work that his family had dedicated themselves to for so long. During his graduation speech, Joshua spoke about the power of using one's voice, about the importance of standing up for what is right even when it's difficult. I've learned from my father that one person can make a difference, he said, looking out at the sea of faces before him, that when we speak up, when we listen to each other, and when we're willing to fight for what we believe in, we can change the world. As the crowd erupted into applause, Marcus felt a wave of emotion wash over him. He thought back to that day on the side of the road, the flashing police lights, the assumptions and biases that had led to the encounter. And he thought about everything that had come after, the reforms, the community building, the bridges that had been built between people who had once seen each other as enemies. It wasn't a perfect world, and there was still much work to be done. But as Marcus sat in the audience, Holding Lena's hand, he knew that they had created something lasting, a legacy of change, of justice, and of hope. And that legacy would continue long after they were gone, carried forward by the next generation of leaders who believed in a world where everyone was treated with dignity and respect. And with that thought, Marcus smiled, ready for the next chapter, wherever it might lead.